Over the past couple weeks, I had the opportunity to meet a home brewer who made me think about life in a completely different way. He was diagnosed with inclusion body myositis, and within two years, he went from doing all the things some of us take for granted, including myself, to no longer having use of his arms or legs. Although confined to a wheelchair, Ron isn't defined by his disease. He still works a full-time job and continues to be an avid home brewer. Recently, Ron invited me over to his house to sit down with him and his wife to talk about his personal journey with this disease, life, and of course, beer. Ron, so tell me, when did you know that something was actually wrong? Uh, so, being an endurance cyclist, I uh, start training in, in early spring, but it was February 2005, and I wanted to get a jump on the season. Gorgeous day out, got on the bike, and I got to a hill, and I went to stand on my pedals, and I couldn't stand up. And I was real shaky on the bike, and I, I, I chalked it up to old age, and I had to try harder. So I amped up my training more, thinking that would solve it. And uh, I went on a, uh, I went to a cycling event with a friend about a month later, and he made a comment that one of my calves was shorter than the other, or was smaller than the other. And from there, Jeanette, I kept complaining to her about my weakness in my legs and she scheduled a doctor's appointment I don't think I would have and we went in and started getting testing done and all the blood work and there were some pre preliminary things that they saw some markers um, and so they came back about a month later with uh, early diagnosis of um, m muscular dystrophy Wow. Yeah, and my, my neurologist, he wasn't convinced, he wasn't settled with that. And so he sent it to the Mayo Clinic. And I'm, so a month after that, it's, it's a three month process. This is, we're in here. They came back that I had inclusion body myositis. And, you know, that is, in short, it's a um, autoimmune disease that attacks the muscles. So it's not neurological, it's muscular, but it attacks all my muscles. So I originally was having a harder time climbing stairs, but saw nothing in my arms. My arms were working fine, but it eventually moved up into my arms and my hands. And wow. at the age of 38, it's a huge thing to have your muscles fall apart on you. So. No kidding. Well, especially to go from a life that you were living that was <laughs> yes. very active. Very so. active, yep. Wow. Yeah. So, Jeanette, how, how did this affect you? I mean, gosh, I mean, all the weight's been put on you now. Yes. Well, I was a happy suburban stay-at-home mom. Involved in PTA at my kid's elementary school, going out with my girlfriends, doing, you know, he would take the boys away for weekends and go fishing and all of that came pretty much to a screeching halt. I mean, I've, uh, you know, had to focus on being at home and being a caregiver. Jeez. And that's a lot to take, because how fast did everything progress from the time you got your diagnosis to where we're at today? I'd say five years. Wow. Yeah. So five years from doing everything that you did to being stuck in a wheelchair. Yep. And, you know, the thing is, is meeting you and hanging out with you. I don't think of you as stuck in a wheelchair. <laughs> you know, we've had a pretty amazing time already to this yeah. point, you yeah. know, and uh, the thing that kind of blows me away is you guys' attitude towards this. We live a pretty real life. And part of that is stepping into the grief, not running from it and our friends we've been blessed with um, have walked us through that grief. As you can imagine, it's not one loss I experience. So the grief process for me <clears throat> happens over and over. But the journey of grief, uh, we don't stay in that, but it's important that we, we grieve. I have to say, Charlie, I, and I'd have to include you. I've only known you for 
a little while now, but the people that we hook up with, that we spend time with, give as much to us as we give to them. So let's talk a little bit about your beer. Okay. The beer that you brewed with and how that whole thing started. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. Uh, Bader's Brewing, they do a mash fest every year, in s actually twice a year, Southwest Washington. And they invited me a couple times to come and have a, one of my beers uh, featured, but uh, there was not accessibility. And they called in December and said, we got accessibility, sign up. We, we have 15 brewers coming, sign up, sign up. So I did. And wow. I'd been brewing a juniper ale for about a year that we've been loving, and my chef of a wife here decided <laughs> that I should put star anise in it for the Ooh. winter. And that adds a little licorice flavor, and of course, I, it's a little gun shy about that, but we actually had, I think, three, two or three runs at it, and it really dialed in the recipe and took that recipe to mash fest in February and won people's choice on that. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. That's you know what a cool award because it's no judges yeah. that are judging that. It's the people. And mm -hmm. you know, nobody's judging it on all those different merits. They're just judging it as a beer. Yeah. You know, and I want to drink this beer. Yep. Yeah. And that I think if I were to be in that such a that'd be the award I'd want to win. Yeah. Is the people's choice. Yep. You know, and yeah, I want to know what the judges think, but at the end, it's exactly. really, are, are the people going to drink it? Exactly. So Yeah, so I, I, that was cool for us to win that. I was like, all right, cool. A month later, Dave Nunez from um, the old Ivy Tavern called me and said, hey, we're thinking about brewing your beer. Would you like to collaborate with us? <laughs> and I'm like, what? So... Doors just started flying open at that point, so it was really cool. It was a dream of a lifetime for me to have someone brew my beer in a real brewery. So that's really cool. Yeah. So, and then you guys couldn't have picked a better person to brew with. Oh yeah, Chris is such an awesome guy. Yep, he is. Uh, yeah, he is. He was great to work with. He. Um, went out of his way to make sure I was involved in the process. Sh bringing the grains over to me, taking a sample of the mash and showing it to me, having me smell it and, and um, trying to talk me out of my hop schedule, but I stuck to it. <laughs> <laughs> he did talk me down on the star and east and that was the right call. So, well, you know, and that's a huge issue, and we got a chance to talk about this a little bit, but scaling. Yes. You know, and most people that haven't brewed don't understand that, but going from five gallons to 15 barrels, and a barrel is 31 gallons, so I'll let you guys do the math. Yep. Um, you just don't take everything and add it up like you think you would do. Right. It's, there's some... There's some tweaking you got to do. Yeah. And, and, yeah, that's a great point, Charlie. I, you know, I've got my uh, Pro Mash program. And I've got my five gallon all grain recipe, and I show up and I'm really looking to Chris to scale this. And he included me in the process because he was, he was asking lots of questions. Hey, what if we do this? What if... So the scaling process was interesting because. Not everything scales. No. How did it turn out? So, or have you had any? Let me, oh, let me yeah. Ask. So All right. I've had some, <laughs> but I, when I got down there uh, for kegging day, Chris immediately brought out a glass for Jeanette and I to try. And young beer, but the star anise was exactly what it should be, which is, oh, wow, there's something up front there, and I don't know what it is, which is what I want. At the mash fest, that's a, that's every response I got from people were like, oh, there's something interesting right up front on the palate. And, you know, it was a smooth drink. As Chris said, I think longer in the keg, the better it's going to get. It, that, and it, that's certainly how it is when I brew it at home. If I let it sit three or four weeks in the keg, it really 
the bitterness mellows out a little bit. The star anise comes up a little bit, but not a, not a lot, and you just have a great drinking beer. Now, this beer, though, is going up to Seattle, correct? Correct, yeah. We're uh, next week, I think, Tuesday. next Tuesday. Well, I say look out Seattle. Yeah. Amen. So, <laughs> there's a man coming with a passion. So. No, I, I want to come hang out with you more often. Oh. I can't name that many people that I look at and respect as much as I do just knowing you for a couple days. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you, that means a lot. And thank you so much for letting us come in and evade your, your home and hang out with you guys because you guys are an amazing couple and uh, it's wow. been a lot of fun. Well, thanks. This has been a cool opportunity yeah. to do this. I had an amazing time hanging out with Ron and his family. He taught me so much about living life and what it means to be truly humble. A few days later, I received a call that the beer was ready and everyone was meeting up at Old Ivy Tap Room in Vancouver, Washington. I was stoked to meet up with the group. I showed up to the tap room in anticipation of some great beer. Soon I was joined by Dave Nunez, the owner, Ron and Jeanette Muck, and Chris Boland from Amnesia Brewing. Now, would you guys brew that again? You know what? That's a, that would be a nice beer to do, especially around holiday time. We were talking about that. Let it age for six months, make it in June, serve it, you know, between Thanksgiving and New Year's. Let it age a little bit. It'd be really nice. The color's beautiful. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a nice looking beer. Yeah, it is. You know, it's approachable. And uh, I guess we're about to have some. Yes, we are. Now, this one's for me, right, Dave? Yeah, that's all you, Charlie. <laughs> Can I pour? You need a straw. Oh yeah, where's the wrong straw? <laughs> Sitting around the table with such a talented group of people proved for a great evening. We had an opportunity to try Ron's beer with its new agreed upon name, Muck You. I was a bit concerned that they had used star anise in the recipe, but like any good craft beer drinker, I was willing to give it a shot. The nose on the beer has a small hint of the star anise while still allowing for the beautiful hop aroma to shine through. Upon taking my first sip, I was surprised at how good it was. It really drank more like a sessionable ale than one at 7.1% ABV. But what really made the beer incredible was the location and the company I had the pleasure to be with. I have had some really cool opportunities filming the Beer Traveler this past year, but it's going to be tough to beat the time I spent with Ron and his family. In such a short period of time, I learned more about living life to its fullest than I've experienced in my entire adult life. I will treasure the opportunity that I was given to become great friends with such an extraordinary person. In closing, if I could share one thing, Appreciate the things that we can change about ourselves and accept what we can't.